At this time, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Dan Corbett, Senior Product Manager for Notifier. Dan, take it away. Thank you very much, David, and welcome everyone to today's Intelligent Fast webinar. It'll be hosted by myself, Dan Corbett, and Notifier for Product Manager, and also my colleague, Stephen Lederer, System Sensor Product Manager. A little bit what we want to cover today, we want to provide an overview of aspiration smoke detection. And we're going to talk about some of the neat features and benefits of the FAST technology. Then we'll go into how we can seamlessly integrate intelligent FAST with Onyx series fire alarm control panels. We'll touch a little bit on some, some of the technical specifications of some of the programming associated with intelligent FAST. We'll look at some applications and case studies discuss some of the collateral that will be available in support of the launch of Intelligent Fast, and then we'll wrap it up with a summary and questions. And with this, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Letter with System Sensor. Hello, everybody. Uh, first, I'd like to start off by giving a broad definition of aspirating smoke detect detection. Aspirating smoke detection uh, is an active uh, smoke detection system which uses a network of pipes to continuously sample air into the detection chamber, so we're always looking for smoke, whereas uh, a standard spot detector is a passive detection system which requires smoke to come to the level of the spot uh, detector in order to activate. Um, so how aspirating smoke detections work, they uh, have a fan or an aspirator inside the housing of the detector itself, and they run a pipe network out into the area being protected. These pipe networks have sampling ports, and each sample port is equal to a spot type detector in terms of spacing. Um, all aspirating detectors incorporate some sort of filtration technology in order to remove nuisance particulate from the sample, and then a high sensitivity uh, sensing chamber, which allows uh, very early warning smoke detection per NFPA 76. Uh, ap applicable codes for aspirating smoke detection, uh, first of all, it's governed by NFPA 72, so in standard smoke detection mode, uh, the sample ports must be spaced as any spot detector would be spaced. It also, NFPA 72 also uh, prescribes uh, standard coverage in high airflow environments. Uh, the first NFPA code that really starts getting into aspirating smoke detection would be N NFPA 75 which details the protection of IT equipment. Now, uh, this is the first that calls out early warning smoke detection, and it also calls out areas in the environment that would need to be protected, such as at the ceiling level, above the ceiling, or uh, below the floor if there is a, a raised floor area. NFPA 76 sets the guidelines for very early warning, early warning, and standard fire detection. Very early warning detection says that uh, transport time from the farthest hole in the aspirating pipe network can be no longer than 60 seconds. Um, sample port spacing has to be 200 square feet, and uh, there's a 0.2% pre-alarm obscuration level at each sampling point and 1% obscuration level for alarm. This also goes to say that uh, spaces 2,500 square feet and below require early warning detection, whereas any space above that square footage will require very early warning fire protection. Uh, Intelligent FAST is UL and FM approved, and we are in the process of getting CSFM approval, which we should have attained in the next week or so. And then there's also the Canadian model, which is ULC approved. So now I'd like to get into some of the, uh, the value offerings that FAST has. So uh, FAST enables high sensitivity smoke detection in some environments that have been considered challenging for aspirating smoke detection in the past. Uh, FAST incorporates a three-stage filtration uh, methodology. The first filtration uh, method being this particle separator. Now this particle separator was developed by our colleagues in Honeywell Aerospace. Uh, it ensures that any heavy large particulate is going to be removed from the sample before it actually enters the detection chamber. Um, this will effectively uh, extend the life of the device, it extends the life of the filter, and ensures that there are reduced uh, false alarms due to nuisance particulate. 
The second stage in our filtration process is a 30 micron replaceable harsh filter. Uh, this filter is, as I said, field replaceable. It just takes uh, two Phillips head screws. Um, this filter is also monitored, so when it, if and when it does become clogged, the device will initiate a filter fault. That filter fault will be a minor filter fault the first time it's given, and then 72 hours later it will be an urgent fault identifying that the filter must be changed. The third stage in our uh, filtration methodology is, is the detection method itself. Uh, FAST uses a blue LED to detect low concentrations of smoke from a wide array of fires and an infrared laser to identify particles not associated with combustion. Then onboard algorithms interpret the signals from both of these sensors and make the decision to either reject the nuisance particulate or activate it in the presence of smoke. FAST also offers many uh, connectivity options. The first is the SLC address addressability, which Dan will go over in more detail. Uh, second, FAST has an onboard Ethernet connection, which enables uh, remote configuration and monitoring when the device is set up with an IP network. This can be done uh, using our Pipe IQ software, or FAST also has a, an internal web server, which allows it, the device to be viewed from anywhere in the world as long as you can connect to that local area network that the FAST is sitting on. Uh, this also enables us to send out email communications uh, for all fire and trouble events. FAST also communicates the Modbus TCP IP protocol through that same Ethernet port, and these are all available standard out of the box on the FAST detector. Okay, there we're going to pause for questions. Okay, thanks, Steve. We do have two questions posted. Uh, the first question is about filtering. The question is, how is your filtering different uh, from other brands offering aspiration detection? So our, our filter is actually monitored by um, measuring the airflow through the chamber. So other manufacturers use particle counting, so there, it effectively has a timer on the filter for when it will need to be replaced. Our filter, we're actually measuring the airflow coming through the chamber, so when we see a reduction in airflow, we can identify that the, the filter does indeed need to be replaced. And also our particle separator, like I said, is patented technology from uh, Honeywell Aerospace. Um, it's something that the competition doesn't offer. Okay. All right. Good. There's no other questions posted at this time, so I do want to encourage the audience, if there's questions that come up during this presentation, simply use that chat box or question box and post it, and we'll get to it as, in as real time as possible. And now we're going to go back to Dan. Thanks, Steve and David. Well, Steve did a great job of giving us an overview of Aspiration and some of the great technology that's included and built in to the FAST units, the particle separator, um, the blue and the red LEDs that can, the particle separator to, to filter out the products and, and the LEDs to truly distinguish between a real alarm and a nuisance alarm. Let's get into the meat of intelligent FAST, or the FSA 8000. So it's intelligent aspiration that's going to now allow us to directly connect this to notify our Onyx series addressable fire alarm control panels via the SLC loop or the signaling line circuit loop. What does this mean as, as we compare this to maybe some other technologies or other alternatives for aspiration with notifier? Well, it's going to require us to, to it's going to reduce equipment costs and installation time because there's no interface cards or monitor modules that are required to purchase, installed, configured, and wired. It's going to provide robust information and real-time information, early warning smoke and fire conditions transmitted directly to the fire panel over the SLC loop. It's going to enable us to combine addressable spot smoke detection and addressable aspiration smoke detection in a single panel. It's going to provide seamless integration, and in this slide that I'm happy enough to get from System Center truly brings it home. If we look at this slide, we just see that the FSA 8000, the intelligent FAST units, just sits directly on the SLC loop with our standard spot detection, pull stations, and modules, and all the rest of the addressable devices that sit on the SLC loop. Kind of compare this to conventional aspiration integration. So when we're talking about conventional aspiration integration, it required additional hardware and wiring. And we were really consider this only really effective for maybe one up to two detectors. 
and the information received at the panel really had no detail. You were strictly just using monitor modules to monitor dry contacts from the aspiration detector. So the amount of modules that were required would really be determined by the, the amount of contacts that were provided by the conventional aspiration detector as well as what the concerned stakeholders were concerned about monitoring from a conventional aspiration detectors. And some of them could occupy up to eight SLC addresses. Also require that, that cost added hardware, the extra wiring, configuration, and potentially troubleshooting either during the installation or follow-up service calls. We also compare it to some competitive SLC aspiration integration. Required an aspiration network, uh, was good up for about 19 devices, but monitoring only. There was no control or read status functions. And if we look at the slide, it also required additional hardware. So we had the aspiration network that would have been required. In this case, there's a protocol translator required to take the information from the aspiration network to be able to make that available translate that protocol. Then it also required an SLC interface. The SLC interface took the information from the protocol translator and made that information available to one of our control panels SLC loops. We look at a high level aspiration integration. It again it required an aspiration network required the same protocol translator to take the information from the aspiration network and make that available to the high-level gateway, which is also required. And then the high-level gateway connected to either an NCM or high-speed NCM in, in high-speed notifier net applications to make that information available onto the notifier net network. So it required the aspiration network and notifier net required at least up to three additional modules, again, that required to be purchased, installed, wired, and configured. And we find that the ordering and setup can be somewhat confusing for some of our customers. Um, with this high-level integration aspiration, we could support up to 100 devices per high-level gateway. It does, have, does offer the ability for monitor control and read status capability from notifier net display nodes. And the notifier net display nodes would either be an NCA2 on the notifier net network, OnyxWorks workstation on a notifier net network, or an NFS23030 operating in network enunciator mode, or AKA or also otherwise known as hybrid mode. We can compare that with an intelligent fast integration. Connects directly to the XLC loop. No additional modules or interface cards required, again, to be purchased, installed, wired, configured, potentially troubleshot. And it programs into the panel as just a standard addressable spot detector. So it just sits on the SLC loop with the standard devices. Let's get into a little of the technical details of Intelligent Fast FSA 8000 and FSA 8000A. Requires SLC. In addition to SLC, it does require auxiliary 24 volts power to provide the operating power for the intelligent fast unit. Requires half an amp or 500 milliamps in standby, 600, 650 milliamps in full alarm condition. And each SLC loop could support up to 31 FSA 8000 units. Um, each intelligent fast unit occupies five detector addresses on an SLC loop. So at five addresses, up to with 31 FSA 8000, takes up 155 points on that SLC loop. What panels is Intelligent Fast compatible with? It's compatible with the NFS 320, the NFS 2640, and the NFS 23030 operating with firmware version 20 or higher. And just in reference to, ver to version 20, we expect to release a firmware, firmware version 20 for our current Onyx series panels next week. We'll require verifier tools version 7.00 or higher in order to configure panels that have version 20 and in order to do the programming parameters for Intelligent Fast. Just a little bit on the configuration. There are five thresholds or kind of sensitivity levels that can be set for the FSA 8000 configured using the system sensor pipe IQ utility. 
Uh, it's the same pipe IQ utility that is used to configure the conventional FAST unit. So it has up to those five thresholds, alert, action one, action two, fire one, and fire two. And each one can be set to a different sensitivity level. So it truly is combining five addresses or five detectors kind of into one in that intelligent FAST unit. And we can program different type codes or different type IDs associated with the five thresholds that have been set using pipe IQ. So verifier tools is going to be used to assign those five addresses to the thresholds previously configured using pipe IQ. Type ID supported would be aspiration, which would be an alarm condition. Have aspiration supervisory, which can create a supervisory condition on the panel. Aspiration pre for a pre-alarm on the panel. Aspiration non or non-alarm, which does not create an alarm on the panel but still provides CVE control. And aspiration reference, where we can set up one of the detector addresses on an intelligent fast unit to be a reference detector, which is going to touch, touch upon in a couple of slides coming up in the presentation. And the flash, the flash scan ID is fast. And here I took a screenshot from Verifier Tools. So now with Verifier Tools version 7.0 or higher, these are the aspiration type codes that are available for intelligent fast. The following are not supported, so it can't participate in cooperative detection. The sensitivity level programming is, is, is grayed out because as we discussed a couple of slides earlier, the sensitivity levels are going to be programmed in the detector via the system sensor pipe IQ utility. Um, and also we don't have intelligent sounder programming because it's not a spot detector that, that, that could potentially sit in a B200S addressable sounder base. We can get robust information can be viewed for each FSA 8000 unit. We can view the percentage of alarm, drift compensation, and also a nice feature that we can also view what the temperature is in the space in which the FSA 8000 is protecting. So a number of troubles that could potentially be enunciated from an FSA 8000, time-based trouble, communication loss trouble, if there was a trouble with the aspirator or, with the, or, or filter is going to create a trouble. It can be put into service mode, which I'm going to talk about as well coming up in a couple of slides. High flow or low flow, which could have to do with potential troubles with the pipe network, as well as a power fault, detector fault, and a configuration fault. And with the NFS 23030 with firmware version 20 or higher, 20 or higher it supports referencing for FSA 8000. So if an FSA 8000 on a loop is assigned as the, the aspiration reference type code, then that detector can be used as a reference or therefore the clean air value for the other fast detectors on the loop. And typically, someone would use a referencing detector in an application where they want to use outside air to condition the space. Uh, in today's world, a lot of people are going green and trying to, trying to save on their energy costs. So in certain applications, they prefer to use outside air to condition the space. One of the things of concern of using outside air to condition the space, if there's contaminant or something that's coming in from the outside air into the space, by using the reference detector, it can set that up as what that clean air value is. So if the reference detector is seeing some contaminant or particulate that's coming in from the outside air, now the other detectors that are referencing back to the reference detector can see what the clean air value is, make them determine if, if they should be going into alarm, if, you know, if, the other, if the reference detector is seeing a certain level of obscuration, but one of the other detectors it's referencing is seeing a different and a higher condition, that's going to signal that this is a true alarm for that device. And the new reference detector field would be zero for no reference detector being used, or it can be set to potential up from 1 through 159 for a valid reference detector address. And the reference and referencing FSA 8000s all need to be on the same signaling line circuit loop. And just a little bit on programming. So here's a, a snapshot or a screenshot from Verifier Tools version 7.00. You can see where we can set up uh, the aspiration type code. The flash scan ID is going to be fast. And we can see that the cooperative detection and kind of the sensitivity settings are grayed out because the sensitivity settings are, again, 
are configured and programmed into the FA, FSA 8000 using the pipe IQ. But we can also take each one of the addresses that are assigned to it and, and associate it with up to five detector zones or five control by event programming. So it truly does program in and configure in to the Onyx series panel as, it, as they were five spot detector addresses. And here's a similar snapshot or screenshot from the NFS 23030 for verifier tools programming. And very similar, you still have the same programming. NFS 23030 supports up to 10 CBEs or control by event uh, programming options with the NFS 23030. Uh, again, we're going to have the sensitivity levels are grayed out. And with the NFS 23030, we do support that reference detector, which would be programmed down here to associate the reference detector. You can also put the, the panel with the NFS 23030, you can also put it into a service mode from the panel, which will cause the detector to shut down. So if a technician needs to go out there to potentially do some type of service, potentially replace a filter, or do some other, other type of service on the intelligent fast unit, they can put it into service mode through the NFS 23030. Through the NFS 23030, they can also reset the detector baseline. And this function resets the detector's airflow baselines and this would need to be run whenever the configuration of the piping changes. So if someone needed to go out there and potentially add some additional pipes to the network, that's where it would be uh, set up to go into the NFS 23030 or the NCA2 and set or reset that detector baseline. And with that, I think we're going to open up another question. David? You bet, Dan and Steve. Um, so the first question comes in. Um, they're, they're wondering when version 7 of Ver Verifier uh, will be available. Excellent question. I'm going to kind of address that later on, but I'll address it now since it came okay. up. Um, the release of Verifier Tool 7.00, as well as Onyx Series Panel firm, Firmware Version 20, and the Intelligent Fast is presently set for October 2nd, so next week. We are, there's a, a number of individuals uh, within Notifier that are frantically scrambling to get all the, all the rest of the push that we need to do to get the product released. But we truly anticipate October 2nd. If it's not October 2nd, it will be sometime next week. Uh, there'll be an announcement coming out. Verifier Tool 7.00, as well as all the supporting firmware, will be posted up onto the ESD site at that time. Okay, great. Um, next question, how is the FSA 8000 powered? Is it directly from the, the panel or in some other way? Um, the FSA, th eight, FSA 8000 could be powered from the panel uh, or it could be powered from any separately uh, UL864 listed power supply. Okay, let's take one more question at this question break here. So uh, do you have to program all the detector points or can you turn off points that are not required to that you are not required to utilize? I believe, and I'm going to actually in a little while later on in the presentation, some of my engineering friends are going to join us. And should we save that one? Jason just joined us. Now, if I could just uh, mute myself for a quick second, David, and I'll be right back with everyone. Okay, good. So if you do have any questions, um, please go ahead and post them. We'll get them to the order received, and we'll have a block of time at the end of the presentation where we're going to be answering questions as well. Um, um, Steve, here's one maybe while, uh, while Dan's muted. Uh, what type of piping is muted, used with the uh, FAST device? Uh, any UL listed pipe, so generally what and what System Sensor offers is a Blazemaster CPVC pipe from George Fisher Harvell. Um, but the, the type of piping, as long as it meets um, 22 to 25 millimeter internal dia diameter and uh, 3 quarter inch uh, outer diameter so that it actually fits into the fast device. But any uh, UL listed pipe for fire or anything that your AHA will find acceptable is is good as long as it, uh, you said, meets the internal and external diameter requirements. Okay, and I think you've, maybe you've covered this, uh, but just let's make sure. Um, and how could you design the piping for FAST? So, uh, as, as Dan was mentioning, the Pipe IQ software uh, is required to configure an FSA 8000 device, and it's also used to uh, do the pipe 
design and uh, calculation function. So that'll tell you, uh, you, you describe to PipeIQ the space that you need to deploy the fast unit in, and PipeIQ will help you lay out the pipe network and uh, the whole placement. Excuse me. And that, that software is available free of charge uh, from the System Sensor website. That's systemsensor.com slash fast. And I should point out that we've also, we've actually done a webinar specific on Pipe IQ. And if you'd like to go to systemsensor.com forward slash fast, you can find that webinar on Pipe IQ. Dan, are you back with us? I am. Okay. Want me to restate the question or do you have it there? No, I think the question was if you, if you needed to use all five addresses. And you do need to use all, all five addresses, so it's not like you could say I want to use just two addresses and free up maybe those other addresses for other SLC points. If, if that was attempted to be done, we'd get a, a trouble report for a dual address. So it does need to take all five addresses. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, so let's, let's get back to the presentation. Let's make sure we wrap the content, and then we'll get back to questions here. All right. Thanks, David. Let's talk about some of the applications for Intelligent Fast. First one we're going to talk about is mission critical, and, and we think back to earlier in the presentation when Steve was talking about some of the codes that driving it, and we had NFPA 75 and 76 that came, kind of came about from NFPA 72 for Aspiration. And Aspiration kind of got its start in these mission criticals, you know, telecommunication, data processing, high-tech manufacturing. And we think about Intelligent Fast and these types of applications, think of, high-tech manufacturing, whether it be someplace in Silicon Valley where, where they're making some type of processor chips. Um, if they were to get an alarm or, or, or even smoke contaminant uh, within that space why that process is being undertaken, uh, it can really cost that manufacturer hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars based upon you know, what type of chip they might be manufacturing. Same thing with some telecommunications or data processing centers. You know, just that small amount of downtime you know, can cost them critically. So they're really looking for the earliest advanced detection, early warning smoke detection that they can get. And by using Intelligent Fast and teaming that up with Onyx Series panels, we can provide that for these mission critical type applications. But it's not just mission critical. There are many other applications for aspiration and for Intelligent Fast. We also think about it for historical purpose or for aesthetics. You think about an old museum or an old church where a lot of the stakeholders, the end user, the architect is really concerned about that look. They don't, they don't want to put spot detectors up on that space. So one of the other features of Intelligent Fast Aspiration is that you can run the pipe network up maybe behind the wall or over the ceiling and then use capillaries that would come down from that hidden pipe network and go down into the protected space to be able to provide that, you know, that, that true active smoke detection. Um, same thing could potentially be tr held true in mansions or you know, high-end condominiums or those types of applications where, again, the concerned stakeholders, architects, and potentially the end user, the building owner, is concerned about the look of, of spot type detectors uh, in, those, in those settings. So they can use, again, they can use aspiration, uh, hidden the pipes, and use those capillaries to come down and protect that space. Also difficult environments, and there's a number of difficult environments where intelligent fast could be applied. Um, start off with cold storage. You have the cold storage area. That cold storage area, the, the environmental parameters within that cold storage area might not meet the listed operating parameters for a spot type detector. A spot type detector is typically rated or listed to be installed in an application from 32 uh, to a 120 degrees, so if you're talking cold storage where it's below 32 degrees, they can install an intelligent fast unit and locate it outside of that cold storage area or out, outside of the parameters that is, that is below that temperature, and then run the pipe network from the intelligent fast unit into the space. Same could be held true for whether it's high humidity areas, if you're trying to protect the space that the humidity levels are above what, what the listed humidity levels are for a spot type detector as well as dirty and dusty environments. And another application is going to be high rack storage. And high rack storage brings a number of challenges associated with it. Um, one could be that you're, as you're looking at high rack storage, uh, maybe their thought was to potentially use beam detectors. But as that beam detector is going through that space, it might not be suited because they're, sto they're storing stuff that could be blocking the beam. Or they're moving things around with forklifts that could potentially 
block that beam and either cause troubles or potentially cause a nuisance alarm. Another thing about high rack storage or just, or just high ceiling areas in general uh, is the effects of stratification on smoke. As smoke starts to rise and rise and rise, eventually it's going to get to a level where it's going to start to cool off and it's going to ru continue to rise no longer. So if you have a you know, high ceiling area and you had conventional or, or, or even addressable spot detectors on that ceiling, that smoke might never make it to that chamber. So it's another application for intelligent fast. Also security concerns, whether it be a hospital or a prison. We, we see a fair amount of aspiration installed in the prisons because a lot of times in the cells, uh, the inmates could either potentially uh, tamper with or damage those spot type smoke detectors. So by using an aspiration type network, it allows them to run that pipe network in and they can much more hidden where the, where the inmates cannot tamper with or damage those detectors. They can't damage the pipe network. And with this, I'm going to turn it over to Steve, who's going to run through some um, case studies for FAST. All right. Thanks, Dan. So as Dan said, I'm going to run through a couple of case studies for FAST, um, kind of making real the applications that he uh, just mentioned. So one place that FAST is installed in a, a mission-critical environment is a uh, building called the Cyber Innovation Center. This is in Bossier City, Louisiana. And this is a, actually a hot aisle, cold aisle uh, cooling strategy in this data center, which is something that's becoming more and more prevalent through uh, data center applications. Uh, in this strategy, what they do is they, they cool the air surrounding the racks, and the servers actually pull that cool air through the rack into a hot aisle that's contained, so cooling themselves off and then exhausting the hot air up through the ceiling, and, which is then returned back to the, the crack unit. So as you can imagine, this is a very high airflow environment. And what they did was they deployed uh, two FASTs in the cold area of the data center and then also two FASTs above the exhaust of the hot aisle in the return air path back to the crack unit. Um, so it was a very high air velocity application. And they actually integrated the FAST as the first trip on a dual action uh, uh, sprinkler system. Uh, a historical and aesthetics case study, uh, the Minnesota History Museum, they uh, actually had a problem where they had an exhibit that was apparently a little prone to uh, smoking. Uh, and it would go on for a little bit before usually a patron actually recognized that there was smoke coming from the exhibit. And the problem was that they had an early draft of the U.S. Constitution that was making a Midwest tour. So they wanted to ensure that they had proper protection so that Obviously, we didn't lose a valuable part of U.S. history. Um, what they were able to do is they were able to provide very early warning so that they had the Constitution protected, but they were also able to keep the aesthetics of the space open uh, by running uh, the, the pipe in a more invisible manner through the, the exhibit itself. So they were actually able to achieve very early warning to give them time to respond and also not interfere with the aesthetics of, uh, of the exhibition. Uh, Apex Tool, this is in North Carolina. They make uh, hand tools like craftsman hammers and, and saws and things like that. And their insurance required that they had uh, early warning smoke detection in their switchgear rooms. Now, as you can imagine, as a byproduct of working with all that metal, they have a very caustic environment, and there's also a lot of dust in the environment. So spot detectors that they previously had installed in the switchgear room were prone to nuisance alarms or dirty detector warnings. So they implemented FAST because of its filtration methodology. And actually, uh, they, they instigated a strategic response level that if they did get an alarm from the FAST device, the security guard would go and make sure that it was indeed a, a fire in the area instead of a, a nuisance alarm. Well, what happened is one day they actually did have an issue out on the production floor. And that smoke seeped from the production floor into the switchgear room and initiated an, an alert at the FAST. Uh, as the guard was walking out to that switchgear room to investigate the incident, he saw that there was an incident on the production floor, verified that there was no issue in the switchgear room, and as a result, they were able to keep production up and running. The Manitoba Youth Detention Center, this is a restricted access case study that we have up in uh, Canada. So they used FAST for, uh, you know, 
all the reasons that Dan said. It also gave them an addressability so that they knew exactly which cell would have the problem should a problem occur. Uh, this also makes it easier for them to maintain and service the device. So with the pipe network, you're able to actually remotely clean uh, the pipe network should it get clogged up from the device, which would be, in this case, outside of the protected area by either vacuuming out the pipe after you've disconnected it from the unit or uh, blowing it out with compressed air. Uh, the sample points are also less likely uh, to be tampered with by the cell occupant. Uh, there are tamper-proof sampling points available and also the sampling points are much more discrete than, say, a spot type smoke detector, which is going to sit up, sit uh, off of the wall and have electronics in it. This sample point is just a hole in a pipe, and uh, using capillary kits, you have a very discrete sample point. And again, uh, if that sample point is in some way tampered with, if they either clog it up or the pipe breaks, you will get a higher or low flow fault at that fast detector, uh, signifying that you do need to go out and, uh, and address the issue. Thank you, Steve. Well, Steve did a great job kind of tying in some true real-life case studies into the, you know, some of the applications that were referenced earlier. Let's talk a little bit about some of the collateral that's going to be available in support of Intelligent Fast. Um, we've updated our PI2 brochure uh, to include Intelligent Fast. There's also some information available from System Sensor. There's a Fast brochure. There's a couple of different white papers. There's some white, one white paper available on applying uh, FAST into cold storage areas, as well as a different white paper on integrating FAST in duct detectors. That's duct detectors. Uh, we also have a data sheet that's going to be available in support uh, of Intelligent FAST, as well as the FA, FSA 8000 or Intelligent FAST installation instructions. And I believe all this information will be available for all the attendees to request for the type of collateral they'd like, and then we'll be followed up with an email that will deliver this uh, to the attendees that, that have requested that information. I know this came up a little earlier, so Intelligent FAST availability. Again, we are expecting to release the FSA 8000, the FSA 8000A, and the other support materials of firmware version 20, as well as Verifier Tools version 7.0 uh, next week. Again, there will be an announcement that will come out, and all of this supporting information material will also be posted up onto our ESD website. Kind of in summary of Intelligent Fast, you know, Steve did a really good job earlier in the presentation talking about you know, the, the features and benefits of using Aspiration to provide early warning. And now with Intelligent Fast, we have early warning addressable Aspiration detection. Connects directly to the SLC loop of the Onyx series panel that, we, that we've called out. So if we think about this as some of the other slides that we saw earlier, you know, using conventional Aspiration or using a competitive SLC or competitive high-level uh, interface integration. This does not require any additional modules, so you don't have modules to purchase, to install, again to wire, to configure, and again to, to potentially troubleshoot. The only thing we're going to need for Intelligent Fast is going to be our SLC connection and then either a, a 24 volts DC power connection either coming from the panel or from a separate UL864 listed power supply. Simple integration. Programs into the panel as standard spot detector. So, you know, once they do the configuration with the pipe IQ to set up the sensitivity of those thresholds, then it's just a matter of programming those five detector addresses into an Onyx series control panel using verifier tools. And as we went through the applications and the case studies, it's suited for a wide variety of ap applications, not just mission critical. So as you go out there and, and interfacing with your customers and engineers, just think about some of the different applications in which Intelligent Fast can be applied. Not just mission critical, it could also be the security concerns for prisons, uh, any, any of those harsh environments or difficult environments, whether it be high rack storage, high humidity, or very dirty or dusty environments with that you know, superior filter and technology that Intelligent Fast brings. Things. It's also well suited for some of those harsh environments. And with that, I think we're going to open up to some additional questions and answers, David. Yep, we sure are, Dan. And I'm going to also post a uh, kind of a quick 
uh, survey here. So how can we help you if there's something that Dan or Steve has mentioned here? Uh, they called out that intelligent data sheet, uh, intelligent fast data sheet, the installation and maintenance instructions, cold storage, or duct uh, white papers, uh, that uh, uh, new info guide, and uh, maybe you want a, a rep to call you. This is a great chance. Uh, go ahead and indicate what your preferences are. We'll leave that up for a couple minutes while we're answering the questions here. Uh, Steve, I think first question for you or Dan, either way, but um, they're wondering uh, how if they need some design support, do we have a team or a process of, of getting them some design support for uh, fast applications within various uh, environments? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, System Sensor offers free design support help. They can help you uh, just with code information or with an actual pipe layout and pipe IQ. Uh, the gentleman's name is Nick Gomez. If you go to the systemsensor.com slash fast website, uh, there's actually an online request form. So if you go ahead and fill out that form with uh, the information about your application, what kind of codes you're working towards, uh, Nick will get in contact with you. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to just fire through these questions that, that uh, some of our attendees have posted here. Uh, they're just wanting some clarification. Does the FSA 8000 have the ability to address different sampling ports, or does it contain one address itself on the notifier panel? Those addresses are oh, – sorry, go ahead, Dan. I was just going to say, as far as the addresses that it takes on the notifier panel, each FSA 8000 would take five detector addresses. Okay. All right. Uh, next question. How many amps on a 24-volt DC uh, power supply um, are needed for the fast detector? The fast detector requires 500 milliamps in standby and 650 milliamps in alarm. Um, so I hope that addresses the question. Just be a matter of running out, running the calculation, your battery calculation, based upon what the backup requirements are going to be, whether it be 24, 60, or potentially up to 72 hours. Okay. All right. Um, they understand the the module situation with fast, but they're asking. Uh, so is it necessary to install a module to reset the fast uh, detector, or when fast goes into alarm? Since it sits on the SLC as standard spot detectors, when you press reset on the panel, you would be in turn resetting the fast unit as well. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, you've addressed it. You've addressed the address question. Let's see. Um, they wanted you to elaborate on the cooperative detection. Uh, you had that, I think, as a slide that uh, it, something was not included. It it doesn't sit. It, it sits on the SLC loop, but it doesn't part doesn't allow participation for cooperative detection. So you couldn't take any of the detector addresses associated with Intelligent Fast and program it for cooperative detection with standard addressable spot detection. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, let's see here. Uh, can it be addressed anywhere on the loop, or does it have to start with 5 slash 10 slash 15? Did that question make sense? Yeah, hold on a second. Give, okay. give me a second, David. All right, no problem. <laughs> We're checking our reference documents here. So while he's checking that, just be sure to go ahead and, and uh, make those selections. A bunch of you have, so we do appreciate that. Uh, we'll be closing that down here in another couple minutes. And we do thank you for joining us today. We'll get through the questions. Also, uh, just know we'll be sending you an email in about an hour uh, with a quick survey. We just want to see what you thought of this webinar. And if you do fill out that uh, survey, uh, you'll be uh, entered into a drawing for a $50 Amazon gift card. Dan, uh, are you yeah, ready? I'm back. Sorry to cut yeah. you off. Uh, thanks to my engineer, my friend from engineering that came up to, to assist me towards the tail end of, of the presentation. Uh, it can either be, as far as the, the starting address of the Intelligent Fast, it can either start at 5 or at any 0. So it can start at 5, it can start at 10 or 20. Obviously, it can't start at 0, 0 because that's not a valid address for us. So okay. you know, it, can, it can be either configured for take up 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 
you could take address 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then you could start another one at 10. Okay. All right. Very good. I think that was actually somebody else's question, what they can start on. Uh, Steve, maybe a question for you. Has the Pipe IQ software been updated recently, and when's our next planned update? Uh, the Pipe IQ software was, I think, our latest release was back in June. Uh, and our next release, uh, we're rolling out Windows 8 support here. Uh, we're just in our final testing right now. We're expecting to roll out Windows 8 support uh, in the next week or so. Okay. All right. Uh, next question, can the FSA 8000 um, take detector addresses or module addresses? Uh, the FSA 8000 takes strictly detector addresses. Okay. All right. A couple piping questions here. Can pipe be painted? Uh, that's a that's a good question, David. So uh, the final decision on pipe painting generally comes down to to the AHJ. So I believe uh, for the CPUVC pipe that we offer through System Sensor, Harvell says that it it may be painted with water-based paint. Uh, obviously, again that the final decision is going to come down to the AHJ. Now, if, you, if your AHJ is okay with the pipe being painted, we recommend painting the pipe before you drill the holes just so that uh, no holes are painted over and sure. subsequently blocked. And also, there are still labeling requirements where you would need to place stickers on the pipe to indicate that it is a smoke detection apparatus. Okay. All right. Next question on piping. Um, they're asking, can you run flus flexible plastic pipe? And I think you've answered that, that they can use just about whatever kind of pipe that, that the HJ allows, right? Right. As long as it meets the internal uh, diameter requirements of 20, 22 to 25 mil, uh, it'll be okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, they're wondering about coverage area, both min and max, for the intelligent fast unit. Uh, the maximum coverage area is going to be 8,000 square meters. That's uh, in standard fire detection, so just normal sensitivity mode. Um, that obviously goes down as you uh, get into your very early warning type uh, detection requirements. So you're, you're, first of all, your sample ports per code are going to have to be closer together, and your transport time when you get down to very early warning can only be a maximum of 60 seconds from the farthest uh, sample point. So. Uh, it's really application specific to how how uh, small that coverage area will get based on your airflows and just the other dynamics of, of the room, but I think you can expect that it would be somewhere around uh, 4,000 square feet for very early warning. Okay. All right. Uh, Dan, I think a question for a panel question for you. Is the reference detector function uh, supported by the 3030 only, or could it be supported by the 320 and 642? At, at the present time, the reference detector is only supported by the NFS 23030, but we are going to be reevaluating that if we can implement that onto the NFS 320 and NFS 2640. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, maybe a general question. Um, they're wondering about sensitivity. Would it be practical? Well, the question is, with it being so sensitive, would it be practical for uh, residents? I know we talk a lot about commercial, industrial, institutional, but a residential application here. What, what do we think about that? So residential, usually when we think of uh, an aspirating detector being put into a residential uh, environment, it's, it's generally a very uh, expensive home. These are expensive detectors, so uh, usually it's a very, you know, it's, it's an aesthetic thing. You know, they've got a very nice room. They don't want spot detectors hanging off the wall. So but an aspirating detector is flexible enough to be deployed in, in a residential environment. So when you program the sensitivity thresholds in the FAST detector, the Pipe IQ software will calculate what your effective sensitivity at each sampling port is. So as I said earlier in the presentation, each sampling port uh, is looked at the same by NFPA as a spot detector. So when you program the head sensitivity for the FAST device, uh, when you're in your calculations for the pipe design, it'll tell you what the sensitivity at each hole is. So it could be programmed for normal sensitivity and used in a residential uh, type application, absolutely. Okay, all right. They're wondering about uh, how blockage is detected. So is it based on the, the number of uh, holes in the pipe that might be blocked, or how, how, do we, how does the detector go about uh, viewing yeah. blockage? Okay, so what happens is when you initially send a, 
a pipe, uh, the sensitivity configuration to the FAST device. It's going to take the first five minutes after that configuration is received to set its airflow baseline. So basically, it's looking at the airflow coming in from the pipes through the FAST detector, and it's going to say, okay, this is my normal airflow. This is what I expect to see. So if, say, a hole gets covered up or holes start getting blocked, uh, the ultrasonic sensors in the in the fast inlet are going to say, okay, I'm seeing less airflow now. And when we, we get to 20% uh, off of our baseline, the fast will actually initiate that low airflow fault. Uh, looking at the front of the fast device, I'm not sure we had a, uh, a good picture of it during the webinar, but we do have a 10-segment airflow uh, reader on the front of the UI, which can either be viewed right at the detector or... Uh, using pipe IQ and as airflow starts to deviate from that baseline either to the negative or the positive that airflow uh, readout will either move to the left in the case of a low flow or to the right in the case of a, a high flow for a breakage. Okay all right here might be a good question is there any uh, relay contacts available on FAST for integration into uh, different systems, system integrations like third-party integrations? There, there are relays on board, um, and those relays, and I'm just going to ask my, my engineering contact a quick question, so if you, if you give me a moment, David. Sure, you bet. Steve, maybe while he's checking that, they're asking also about maximum length of pipe, number of sampling holes uh, for one detector. You want to address those kind of questions? Yeah, sure. So the maximum single pipe run, so one pipe coming out of the detector, is 262 feet. Uh, total aggregate pipe length is 328 feet. Um, the maximum number of sample holes is uh, 40, but those are not necessarily uh, able to be combined. So it's not you, you won't necessarily be able to get 40 sample holes on 328 feet of pipe. Uh, those are calculations that you'll have to run through the Pipe IQ software. Okay. All right. And how does the system function in high moisture areas? High moisture. Um, so what we can do for a high moisture or high, uh, high humidity area is you can actually create a moisture trap in, in the pipe network. Uh, this is kind of described in that uh, cold storage white paper that, uh, that David and Dan were mentioning. Uh -huh. uh, so let's let's hypothetically say it's a cold storage environment. Um, the device can be mounted outside of the the harsh environment, and then wh while you're sampling this high humidity air from inside the cold storage environment, obviously when it gets to the outside air, it needs to be warmed up, which is going to cause condensation. So what you do is you um, you install a, a drip trap in in the pipe network before the the air actually enters the device, which will uh, remove all that moisture from the sampled air, which will prolong the life of the detector. And as I said, there's there's more information on that in that uh, cold storage white paper. Okay. And uh, you know, we'll be sure to get that out to people to here. here. Yeah. Yep. You bet. So go ahead and select that as one of your options here. So Dan, are you uh, are you back with us? I am. All right. Yeah, so the Intelligent Fast has six relays. Has one general trouble relay that's going to activate for for any trouble. Then has five relays that are kind of associated with the thresholds that were configured. So, you know, alert one is going to cause the alert one relay, and action one is going to cause the action one relay to go, um, and, and et cetera. In addition to that, with the NFS 23030, if any of any of the attendees are familiar with the ability on the NFS 23030 to use some of the control by event equations to activate additional relay bases, it, it's very similar in that programming. So if someone desired to, they could have some other event or some other detector that, that went off on an NFS 23030 that can in turn activate one of those one of those relays on the FAST unit through the CBE programming. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, next question seems pretty specific here, but is the FSA 8000 approved for all release applications? Uh, is the question is it is it approved for re releasing applications? It's well, it says it says release, but uh, tell you what, let me let's go back to the person uh, you know who asked that. Uh, so Jake, if you can 
uh, clarify for us, and we'll come back. We'll circle back to you before the end of the webinar. Here, we've got a couple minutes left. Um, let's just go jump to the next one. What is the typical CFN value for the FS8 FSA 8000? The CFN value. Yeah, I'm not sure what, uh, what what CFN stands for. Could you get some clarification? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, Richard, if you asked that question, so if you can uh, go ahead and um, and repost that for us. Let's see here. A um, couple questions on testing it. How do you test the system? How the system tested for annual fire alarm inspections? Who can address that one? Yeah, I can take that one. So, um, when you design the system using Pipe IQ, uh, you'll get calculations for transport time from each sampling hole. So the way to do an initial commissioning test of a, of a FAST unit is to go to the farthest sample sample point uh, in terms of transport time, which will be indicated on your pipe layout report from Pipe IQ. Uh, you introduce canned smoke to that sample port and start a timer. And then that timer should run until the first segment on the the user interface of the FAST is illuminated. It doesn't need to go into full, full alarm. We're not verifying sensitivity with a commissioning test. So it, you just need one light to go on on that uh, pre-alarm segment graph that we have on the FAST. Okay. You stop the timer, and if you're within, you're within the bounds of uh, the time that's indicated on the Pipe IQ layout report, um, then we verify that the system is performing as expected. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and take the how we can help you slide down. So I'll close that. Thank you to the 72% of you that actually uh, requested some information. We do appreciate that. And I, guys, I think we have the contact slide next, don't we? Let's go ahead and uh, show people that. The next slide in the deck. Nope, I guess we don't. Okay. Uh, so um, you'll, we'll be sending you out Stephen and, and Dan's uh, contact information. So, boy, we have maybe time for one or two more questions here. Let's see what's one that we haven't uh, asked here. Um, if the detector is outside of the protected room, is it required? Are you required to run an exhaust pipe back to the room? Yeah, that would be a, a design best practice. So uh, you're going to find that uh, you need to sample an exhaust from the same room just to make sure that you're in the same ambient pressure environment. Otherwise, you could uh, run into some uh, airflow issues. So okay. yes, you should e exhaust into the same area that you're sampling from. OK. All right, Jake did respond here. Um, and he's asking actually about uh, releasing clean agent applications. So is the FSA 8000 approved for those types of applications? You could take, if you have the FSA 8000, so you have it in that detector group, so if it's L1D10 is your first address that you've associated with one of the levels that were set up in Pipe IQ, you could associate that into a releasing zone, into a releasing equation. You just couldn't use any of the relay contacts or anything associated directly on the FSA 8000 to do releasing, but the points associated with an FS, FSA 8000 could be included uh, in a releasing zone, potentially as part of a cross zone or, or whatever that whatever that releasing zone is going to be programmed for. Okay, all right. Um, and then just a question back on testing. They're asking how much smoke is needed, 10 seconds of spray, more or less. They're asking those as questions. Uh, yeah, ten seconds seems like it might be a little bit, a little bit, but three or four seconds uh, should do it. Just enough to, that we can make sure that the, uh, you know, don't don't give it a, a light little spritz. We need, you know, get two or three seconds of smoke just to make sure that we we can verify that transport time effectively. Okay, very good. Well, that is the top of the hour, and we want to we want to uh, conclude here. We appreciate your time and attendance. Uh, on behalf of Notifier and System Sensor, I want to thank you for joining us today. As a follow-up, we do plan to send you that brief survey in about an hour and appreciate your help filling it out. And we will plan to reward one of you that completes a survey with a $50 Amazon gift card. That does conclude our webinar. Thank you for joining us. Please have a nice rest of the day.